Chapter 7, Musical Expression, Tempo, and Dynamics. So your textbook talks about a lot of terms, and I've narrowed them down to just a few that I think are important for you to know. First one is tempo. So again, keep in mind that we want to have words to describe the music that we listen to. So when we want to talk about the speed of a song that we're listening to, whether it's fast or slow, that word is tempo. Tempo describes the rate of speed or pace of the music. Um, sometimes a song that you like might gradually get faster or slow down. So the words to describe that accelerando, think of it like the acceleration pedal in your car. You're speeding up whenever you use that pedal, you're accelerating. So it's speeding up the tempo or retardando, slowing down the tempo. It, makes the music more exciting whenever you change the speed. So some other words going along with that, we need to talk about whether something is loud or soft. Again, these are all things that you might think about whenever you're listening to it, but I'm giving you some tools or words to describe the music. So dynamics talks about the volume or the degree of loudness or softness at which music is played. And this has an effect on us. Um, when we listen to something soft, then we feel a certain way, like a lullaby we might be peaceful. Would we ever imagine a lullaby to be extremely loud? Probably not. So it does affect our emotional response. Now, we have a few um, Italian words. We have piano, which means soft, and forte, which means loud. Now, just like with our tempo, we need to have words to describe getting louder and getting softer. So crescendo means gradually getting louder, and diminuendo means growing softer. Great, we have all of those terms down. Let's move on from there. So how do dynamics influence our response to music? And what role does a performer take in expressing the music? So think of it this way. You're looking at a piece of music, and the music tells you to play soft. Well, have you ever asked different people what their definition of soft is? Everyone's definition is slightly different. So it's up to the performer to decide what soft means to them, or what loud means to them, or what getting faster means to them. Unless the composer is very specific in what he or she wants, it's up to the performer to make those decisions. That's kind of cool and freeing. So. Moving on from there, we have the most exciting chapter in the whole entire book, which is about instruments. So maybe you know some things about instruments, maybe you don't. Um, hopefully this will be a quick refresher for you. So what is a sound and what are its components? Great question. I'm glad you asked. So if I performed a sound for you and I went, ba what components are in that noise that I just made. There are actually four. Ba well, the first thing you might say is that it has a beginning and an end. I didn't sing on and on forever. Ba blah, 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 right? So it has a duration. Now, I also didn't sing. Ba I sang. Ba it had a specific pitch. So that's number two. It has a duration. It has a pitch. And then... I didn't sing, ba, I sang, ba, so at a specific dynamic level or volume. And number four, it has timbre. Timbre is the quality of sound. So I didn't sing, ha, I sang, ah, I didn't have that vibrato, that weird wah, 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 wah sound. I had a specific timbre or quality to my sound. So those are the components of a sound, all four of those, pitch, duration, volume, and timbre. Now, each instrument that we're gonna talk about makes a sound because something vibrates. That might be different depending on the instrument family that we're talking about, but something has to vibrate to create the sound. So, Western instruments, meaning instruments that we talk about here in the United States, are split up into four categories. Those are strings, woodwinds, brass, and percussion. You might know this, we're gonna breeze through it, that we cover all of those things, and your book also talks about it. So, string instruments first, they can be divided into what's called plucked and bowed. What do I mean by that? That means, how are we playing the instrument? So, if you think of a harp, 
someone is typically sitting down and they're using their fingers and they are plucking the strings. Or if you're playing a guitar, you might be strumming or using your fingers and plucking the strings. If you're playing a violin, however, you're using a bow and you're playing that across the string and that is causing the string to vibrate and the bow to vibrate and that creates the sound. So there is an accompanying um, sheet that has links so that you can listen to all of these instruments as we go along so they don't have to force you to listen to them through the screencast. So look for that so you can listen to all of these instruments we're talking about, including the harp and the guitar. So moving on from string instruments, we have woodwind instruments now. Woodwind instruments are kind of my favorite because I play the flute. So I can tell you lots about it. Now, what's going to vibrate is your air. Whenever you're blowing, your air is vibrating and that is causing a sound. Now, we typically have finger holes or places that we have um, our fingers that are changing the notes. So they don't create the sound, but they're changing the notes that way. So our typical woodwind instruments are flute, clarinet, oboe, bassoon, and sometimes saxophone. Saxophone um, is used in our later symphonies and things like that, but not typically at the beginning. So let's start with the flute. So the flute, one of the best instruments ever. Let me tell you all about it. So it's in three parts. We have a lot like the human body, we have the foot joint, we have the body, and then we have the head joint. So they all go together like so, and then you got your flute. And I have to use a lot of air to create the sound. And I blow into the head joint. Like that. And I can play very low like that. Or really high. So that is the flute. We get to do some other really cool things like what's called flutter tonguing. If you've ever rolled your R's, like a rrr, you can do that while you're playing the flute and it has a very interesting sound. It changes the timbre. That's called flutter tonguing. Just as a side note. The other thing that flute players can do, they can sing and play at the same time. So I'm going to sing a note while I'm playing a different note. Has a very interesting sound, right? So that is the flute. We can change our timbre, we can change our dynamics, all of those very cool things. Moving on from the flute, we have some instruments that use what are called reeds, and those vibrate to change the sound. So our first instrument that uses a reed is a clarinet. This is what a reed looks like right here. Here's what some uh, broken reeds look like, just for you. Clarinet uses a reed. The reed vibrates as well as the air to change the sound. Um, and it's usually held straight in front of you. Again, look for those recordings on the separate document. We have the oboe. Oboe uses what's called a double reed. So it's two reeds smashed together. And that vibrates along with the air to change the sound. Then we have the bassoon. The bassoon is a lot larger. Um, and it plays a lot of the lower notes or the foundation of harmony for the ensemble. And we have the saxophones. You've probably heard saxophones before. They sound familiar. Um, there are four main ones that we listen to. That's the alto saxophone, shaped like this. The soprano saxophone is actually straight up and down. Then we have the tenor saxophone. It's larger. And the baritone, which is the largest of the four we're talking about. For um, our purposes, if you think of some, an instrument that's larger, it's going to be lower. And the smaller the instrument, the higher it can play. So the larger the instrument, the lower it can play. And the smaller the instrument, the higher it can play. Moving on from there, we have brass instruments. Now, brass instruments don't use a reed. They use their lips and their lips buzz to create the sound as well as the air. So we have our trumpet here. Now a trumpet doesn't have a whole bunch of keys like the flute does and only has three valves. So what they have to do is they have to change their buzzing to get a whole bunch of different note combinations just with one fingering. Then we have the trombone over here. The trombone has a slide and this moves up and down and that changes the pitches as well. Next we have the French horn. French horn has um, a lot of hunting calls. It's used um, 
a lot of pastoral music. It's a very resonant sound. Um, I should click this. There we go. And we have the tuba, one of the largest instruments. It plays a lot lower. Um, it doesn't typically have very exciting parts in the orchestra. It's playing the foundation for the harmony, so maybe a lot of bump, 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 bump or just long sustained notes. They don't really typically get to play, you know, music that sounds like birds, like the flute does, things like that. So that covers the brass section, then we have the percussion section. Percussion section is used to propel the music, to accentuate the rhythm, to bring excitement to the music, all sorts of fun things like that. So you might typically think of a drum set when you think of percussion. It's very, very normal to think about. Um, in an orchestra, one person will be playing each portion of this drum set. Um, percussion players use different instruments to change their timbre or the quality of sound. So to match with um, maybe a Latin piece, they would use some Latin instruments like bongos or um, the guiro over here, things like that. They also have instruments here, like this is a marimba. Um, it's shaped a lot like a piano, and you use mallets to play that, and you also have the timpani over here on the right, all sorts of percussion instruments. Did you know that the piano is considered a percussion instrument? Why do you think that is? Well, the piano actually has hammers inside the instrument that strike the string, which is it's striking something that's considered a percussive instrument. So. We have different forms of the piano depending on what time period we're talking about. The one here on the right is the most common one that we're used to seeing, which is the piano. Over here on the left, we have the harpsichord, used a lot in earlier music. We'll talk more about all of these later. Then we also have the organ. Organ is a very impressive instrument with multiple rows of keyboards and push buttons and pedals and all sorts of wonderful, exciting things going on. All right, so wrapping up here with the musical ensemble in chapter 10, um, I have a graphic here for you of what the typical layout of the orchestra looks like. Now, you do not need to know specifics. What I would like for you to know is where the loudest sounding instruments are located and the softest sounding instruments are located. So here is going to be where the audience is, and this is the end of the stage. Okay, so the conductor is located the very beginning of the stage because everyone has to see what the conductor is doing. Next are the string instruments because they are the softest sounding instruments. Then we have our woodwind section here and then in the back we're going to have our brass section and our percussion. Percussion being the loudest that we have so they're going to be located in the back. Now de depending on what orchestra you go to or what country you're in this might vary slightly but for our purposes this is what you need to know. Conductor at the front, the softer instruments in the front, and the louder instruments in the back. So, what is a conductor? Conductor is the group leader. He's the one that helps keep the group together, know when to start or stop a piece. He also interprets the music. So if you have, you know, 70 people in your orchestra, do you want all 70 players to have their own ideas? That you have to constantly be, you know, arguing back and forth. No, you need one leader that's going to interpret the music for the group. And the conductor does that for you. And sometimes they have really cool hair, like Gustavo Dudamel. There you go.